Ginger Rogers, originally scheduled to star on the Screen Director's Playhouse tonight, will not be heard because of illness. In our star role tonight, we are happy to present Miss Joan Fontaine. RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television, proudly presents... Screen Directors Playhouse, star Joan Fontaine, production It Had to Be You, directors Don Hartman, Rudolph Maté... Hollywood Screen Directors present a little fun, a little fantasy. For the first time on the air, the motion picture comedy, It Had to Be You, starring Joan Fontaine as Vicky. We hasten to assure the radio audience that the following is based upon scientific documents gathered in the case of George X, a figment of the imagination. Unlike most figments, however, George materialized one day into an apparently real human being. Here, then, is an account of the incident as set down by his own hand in the following letter. To the American Institute of Psychological Phenomena. Gentlemen, in the interest of science, I hereby submit this report. You see, I am a figment of the imagination. A rather handsome, dashing figment. But nevertheless, a figment. Temporarily named George. I was created by one Victoria Stafford, a golden-haired young lady of such provoking anatomy that I could never quite bring myself to regard her as my, uh, mental mother. <laughs> Vicky, I might add, was a sculptress who fancied herself in love with a stuffed prune named Oliver H.P. Harrington. Oh, Oliver, I do love you. I'm almost sure I do. Under these circumstances, the following action became necessary. Vicky was returning from Maine, where she'd been fashioning statues while making her decision to marry Oliver H.P. Harrington. Oh, Oliver, I do love you. I'm almost sure I do. Having made said decision, Vicky wired Oliver H.P. Harrington to meet her, took the train, fell into a deep sleep, and immediately proceeded to dream. <laughs> this, of course, is where I came in. This is strange. I wonder where I am. Why, it's a merry-go-round. Round and round and round. And here's Oliver. We're going to be married, Vicky. Oh, yes, Oliver, dear. I'm almost sure we are. Stop the merry-go-round. Now, see here, what's the meaning of stopping our merry-go-round? Yes, this is my dream, and I thank you to keep out of it. This can't go on. You can't marry Oliver H.P. Harrington. But I love Oliver H.P. Harrington. You don't love Oliver H.P. Harrington. You love me. I love Oliver, Oliver, Oliver. <laughs> Oliver, Oliver, Oliver. Oh, it was just a dream. Oh, it's all right, darling. I'm I'm almost positive I love you. You're a liar. I am not. A... Hey, who are you? I'm the man you dream about. You get out of here. Oh, now listen, Vicky. Remember, stop the merry-go-round. You don't love Oliver H.P. Harrington. You love me. Why, you are part of my dream. You're nothing but the broiled lobster I ate last night. <laughs> now, uh... Vicky, no man likes to be told he looks like a case of indigestion. You're not a man. You're a, a, a refugee from a dose of baking soda. <laughs> Prove it. I will. Better answer the door. I'll show you. You're not here at all. We're coming into New York, Miss Stafford. Conducted. Do you see anybody else in my drawing room? Oh, why? Why, Miss Stafford? What's wrong? Uh, there, there's a man in your berth. And you're only paying for a single. Oh, my, he is real. Most irregular, most irregular. You get out of that berth, the very idea. All right, but you never acted like this in our other dreams. <laughs> We've met before? 
Well, met isn't quite the word for it, Vicky. Hey, you remember the dream about the moonlight swim when you're uh, bathing? Never soon? mind. Uh, what do you want, anyway? Well, it's not what I want. It's what you want. I'm a figment of your imagination. When you think about me, I appear. Why? Well, because you want me or somebody just like me. And you don't want Oliver H.P. Harrington. Oliver? Oh, oh, Oliver. Well, he's meeting me at the train, but look, how am I going to get rid of you? Oh, it's very simple. I'm imaginary. You see, if you don't think about me, I won't be here, out of mind, out of sight. That's me. All right. I'll think about something else. I'll keep saying, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their party. Oh, that's an excellent idea, Vicky. but I'm afraid every time you look at Oliver, you're going to think about me. Well, I'll... Well, I'll... I'll go right home from the station. I won't meet Oliver. Now, go on, disappear. Now is the time for bye all bye, good men. Vicky. Now is the time for all good I'll men. I'll meet you at home, Vicky. Now is the time for all good men. <laughs> Mother, father. Oh, we're so happy for you, darling. Yes, so you're finally going to marry Oliver. Where is he? Didn't he meet you at the station, Vicky? Uh, well, father, you see, I, uh, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their party. Good Lord, the girl's gone balmy. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just going to make a statue of a typewriter, father. I'm, I'm just trying to get in the mood. Now is the time for Vicky. all good men. Oliver. Victoria, where were you? Um... Oliver, I, I wasn't on the train. I, 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 I drove in from Maine. Drove? Whoever with? Uh, with some friends, just some casual friends. And now is the time for all good men. Now is the time for all good men. What did you say, darling? Party. It's her way now of preparing for a typewriter statue. You're lucky she isn't making a foghorn. Oh, no, <laughs> Miss, Miss Stafford. Yeah, yes, Evans. Uh, there's a young man to see you. See me? Yes, he says you're expecting him. Oh, oh, uh, well, I'm not. I, I've never seen him before. Tell him, um, tell him, uh, now is the time for all good men to come to the aid of their party. Are you calling me, Vicky? <gasps> oh, dear. Hello, everyone. Oh, you must be Victoria's parents. Hello, Martha. Uh, where? Hello, Horace. <laughs> <laughs> and here we have Oliver, haven't we? My name is Oliver H.P. Harrington. Putting on a little weight, aren't you, Ollie, old boy? I say. Uh, mother, uh, father, Oliver, this is, um, George. George? Oh, oh Vicky, that wasn't what you called me this morning. Victoria, where are you with this man this morning? Of course, on the train. Uh, on the way down from Maine. Uh, George drove me. Uh, but I thought you said just casual friends. Casual? Oh, Vicky, haven't you told them about us? Victoria? Just what is there to tell? Uh, tell? Well, it's, it's all very simple, you see. George is a... He, uh, he's my model. What kind of model? <laughs> oh, we're just doing simple figures. Sculpture, you know. Uh, yes, of course, we're calling it... Um, what are we calling it, George? Adam. Adam? <laughs> I'm, I'm still working on the statue. I thought we'd, we'd finish it here. You know, just... Uh, just to chip away at the old clay. Oliver, I think it's only right that you and I had a long, heart-to-heart, man-to-man talk. Oh, oh no, no, not now. Uh, don't you think you'd better do a little work, George? Uh, well, the light's still good. I'll, I'll show you where your room is. Come, George. Of course, Vicky, darling. Mr. Stafford, isn't this rather irregular? Uh, not for a daughter who keeps calling men to the aid of their party. If your daughter doesn't wish to marry... Oh, don't say that, my boy. We live for the day when we'll get rid of... When we'll see Victoria happily married. Now, you leave everything to me. I'll have that, that model out of here in a few hours. I'm going right upstairs and have a talk with Adam. Hey, George! <laughs> I'll be quite frank, young man. We don't want you here. Oh, I'm afraid we can't do anything about him, Father. Oh, yes, we can. We can call the police. Oh, I wouldn't do that. You know, the reporters, the scandal. Scandal? Vicky, just what has transpired between you two? Oh, no, it's you I'm talking about, Horace. Huh? I seem to recall a little incident in Paris, the uh, Folie Bergère. It's a little number named Babette. <laughs> Victoria. Father, I, I never said a word. I, I don't know how he found out. Babette. Oh, good Lord. If your mother ever discovers that. You see, Father... Of course, if you just let me stick around and finish up my, uh, work. Oh, oh no, 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 you, you can't. Oh, of course he can, Victoria. 
Nice young man like him. What's the harm of having him in the house? Oh, but you don't understand. He, he's not a man. He, he, he's a figment. Really? Well, I'll talk to you later, Vicky. <laughs> Why are you here? Why? Why? To keep you from marrying the wrong guy. Well, I'm going to marry the right guy, Oliver H.P. Harrington. Now, that's impossible. You're in love with me. How can I be in, in love with a, a dream? Those girls are, you know. How could I possibly be in love with you? I'll show you tonight. When I meet you in your dream. Dream? Oh, I guess I have to sleep sometime, don't I? Oh, Oliver, I'm sorry. You should have found a girl with insomnia. <laughs> You are listening to the Screen Directors Playhouse production of It Had to Be You, starring Joan Fontaine and presented by RCA Victor. That name, RCA Victor, has always meant a passport to happiness for all of us, in radio, in recorded music, in television. But probably never before has it meant so much happiness for so many people as it will with the new 1950 10-inch television set, the T-100. For this new RCA Victor 10-incher is the television set for which countless Americans have been waiting and hoping. It brings you the finest television in the world, RCA Victor Eyewitness Television, at the suggested list price of only $169.95 plus tax. Yes, you heard correctly. Only $169.95 for a television set by RCA Victor, the master of them all. It's like getting a genuine diamond at costume jewelry prices. So don't let your television dreams be nipped in the budget any longer. Get your 10-inch set, the T-100, at your RCA Victor dealers soon. And to you and all your family, happy looking. Now, back to the Screen Directors Playhouse production of It Had to Be You, starring Joan Fontaine as Vicky with Gerald Moore as George. Gentlemen, there are some facts which even a figment of the imagination cannot reveal. No, not even to the American Institute of Psychological Phenomena. Therefore, in connection with the dream I shared with Vicky that night, I can only report, Wow! <laughs> and the next morning, Oliver came to breakfast. I said, my dear, you're looking a little pale this morning. Am I, Oliver? Um, um, could I have the tellers, please, Mother? Dear, your father and I both feel that you need a rest. A good idea. Get rid of that model. Good Lord! Is he still in the house? Good morning. Good morning, Vicky, darling. Mother, father... Ah, breakfast. Oh, Oliver, you look rather liverish this morning. Liverish? Well. Oh, there's nothing wrong with Oliver's liver. Let's not discuss it. Uh, pardon me, Miss Stafford, but there's a gentleman to see you. A gentleman? Who is he, Evans? Uh, a railroad conductor. He mentioned something about an extra passenger in a drawing room. An um, extra? Oh, no. Well, he, he must have made a mistake. Um, be a lamb and um, throw him out on his ear. Uh, what's this all about? Tell him we'll see. Uh, uh, yes, sir. Uh, Father, I think I'll go upstairs and take a nap. Victoria, you'll talk to the gentleman with your mother and myself. Ah, let's see what the trouble is, shall we? Oh, Oliver, you stay here and polish off the eggs. Family business, you know. George, stay right where you are. All right. Let's all stay and talk about Babette. Uh, 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 very well. Uh, come along. You'd better wait here, Oliver. I'm sorry, Oliver. Just remember, I love you. I guess. You see, I'm responsible for the passengers on my run. Uh, yes, yes, go on. Well, it's uh, just that your daughter only paid for one passenger, and, of course, there uh, <coughs> were two in the drawing room. You mean Vicky was on the train? Yes, Mother, I was on the train. Uh, perhaps uh, Mr. Stafford here would like to pay the other fare. That's George. I'm Mr. Stafford. Uh, what are you looking at George for? No, the poor chap's made a perfectly natural mistake. Oh, oh. <clears throat> well, I, I'm sorry. I, I saw you in, uh, 
in the young lady's drawing room yesterday, and at first I thought, uh, well, and then I thought... Do me uh, a favor and uh, don't give it another thought. Hmm? <laughs> I'll see that you get a check. Good day. Well, uh, thanks. George. Would you please have the decency to leave the room? Now, now, Mother, we mustn't be too hasty with the boy. Horace, what kind of a father are you? Very well, I'll leave. Perhaps Oliver's left a few eggs. I bid you good morning. Father, Mother, I, I suppose you want the truth. Well, not necessarily the whole truth. <laughs> Horace! Well, you see... George isn't an ordinary man. As a matter of fact, uh, he isn't really a man at all. Well, that explains it. Let's go to breakfast. <laughs> What's the matter with you, Horace? Continue, Victoria. George is just a... just a figment of my imagination. He stepped right out of one of my dreams on the train. I, I know that's hard to believe, but it's the truth. Oh. Vicky, can't you have more confidence in your parents? Well, Martha, it's all perfectly clear. The fellow stepped out of a dream. You, you just go to sleep and dream about someone, and then there he is, right, Victoria? <laughs> I'm glad you understand. Well, I've had quite enough of this nonsense. Horace, I must insist that you get this man out of our house. But he's a dream. It can't be done. Oh. <laughs> Victoria, I think it will be best all around if you marry Oliver immediately. You mean marry... Oliver? But don't you love him? Mm, yes. <laughs> Very well, then. Tomorrow, Victoria. A small wedding here at home. The sooner we get it over with, the better. Yes, Mother. But I don't know what George is going to say about this. Hello, George. Good evening, Vicky. All right, if I come to the library? Why, certainly, Vicky. Thanks. Oh, this house is going all apart. All these foolish wedding arrangements. What are you looking at, George? An album of your baby pictures. Are you really going through with this wedding? Hmm, guess so. But, George, what if I don't love Oliver? <laughs> oh, that's a foolish question. Nobody could possibly love Oliver. <laughs> Something terrible has happened. What? I don't love him. Bravo! I love you. Oh, now, wait a minute, wait a minute. No, no, I'm a dream. And if you've fallen in love with me, it only means that you've fallen in love with somebody who looks like me, but isn't me. Do I make myself clear? No. No. Well, let's look at your baby pictures, huh? I was a horrible little beast. Oh, darling, you were a golden-haired angel. Look at this set. Victoria, age six. <laughs> that was my birthday party. Father had a whole carnival set up. Merry-go-rounds and everything. And here you are on the merry-go-round. <laughs> you had men fighting over you even then. <laughs> Those two little boys glaring at each other. One was exceedingly handsome, wasn't he? George! What? He looks like you. He looks exactly like you. So he does. You know, I didn't really think he was that handsome. And... <laughs> Here he is in another picture. Kissing you. Here's his name. See, written next to him in the album. Johnny Blaine. George, the merry-go-round. Remember the dream? Vicky, this is the fellow you're in love with. He doesn't look like me. I look like him. Oh, it's... Well, it, it, it's fantastic. There it is, Vicky, your whole story. Oh, and believe me, honey, it's beautiful. Two little kids fall in love when they're six years old and love each other so hard they can never love anybody else ever again. Oh. Ever. Oh, it's no use, George. I have to marry Oliver. <laughs> Come on, let's face it, Vicky. If you're in love with me, you're in love with this Johnny Blaine. And you just have to marry him. But how? I don't even know where to find him. And, and I'm going to marry Oliver tomorrow. Oh, the trouble with you, Vicky, is you don't trust your imagination. Now, you go to bed and leave everything to me. Mm, all right. Am I going to see you in my dream? Not tonight. Then I think I'll have a night nightmare for a change. <laughs> Good night, Vicky. I've got to talk to your father about the Blaine family. Find out where they used to live, what happened to them, where Johnny is. Hi, 
fire station, 42. Uh, is there a Johnny Blaine there? Speaking. Who's this? Well, Johnny, you wouldn't believe it if I told you. Uh, Tell me, do you dream about a girl? A beautiful, golden-haired girl? Yeah. Why? Have you ever been engaged? Three times. What's it to you? <laughs> but you never married? No. <laughs> Naturally. Well, all I can say is that it's a very good thing that the Stafford residence is in your fire district. Hey, what's this all about, anyway? You'll find out, Johnny. You'll find out. And now, gentlemen of the Institute of Psychological Phenomena, my report is closed. At this very moment, Vicki Stafford is about to be married to Oliver H.P. Harrington in the next room. I have one more job to do before sinking back into oblivion. Signed, yours very truly, George, a figment of the imagination. There, that's done. Now the phone. Please uh, connect me with the fire station 42. Hello? I'd like to report a fire at the Stafford residence. Oliver H.P. Harrington, take Victoria Stafford to be a lawful wedded wife, and do you solemnly promise that you will love, honor, and cherish her until death shall separate you? I do. Do you, Victoria Stafford, take Oliver H.P. Harrington to be a lawful wedded husband? Oh, dear. And oh, do you my. solemnly promise... <laughs> well, what's going on here? Where's the fire? Oh, Look out, I'm coming in the happened? window. Uh, where is it? Where is it? Where's the fire? Oh, George! I knew you wouldn't let me marry Oliver. My name isn't George. It's Johnny. Johnny Blaine. Where's the fire? Johnny Blaine. The man I'm in love with. Hey, you look familiar. You probably dream about me. Dream about... Oh, that's ridiculous. Say, your hair, it's gold. You're her. You're the girl. Of course I am. We love each other. We do? Hey, uh, oh, what about the fire? There isn't any fire. No fire? <laughs> hey, fellas, stop tearing up the furniture. It's a false alarm. <laughs> oh, that's all right, Johnny. It's all part of my beautiful story. George told me we're going to be married. It had to be you because two little kids fell in love so hard that they could never love anybody else ever. And you're not a figment at all. You're real. Oh, sure I'm real. But how did you get out of my dream? <laughs> I'll tell you on our honeymoon, Johnny. And, oh, thank you, George. Thank you. You have just heard the last act of It Had to Be You. Joan Fontaine and two very special guests will be with us in just a moment. Next Friday, another great star brings one of his most compelling performances to the screen director's playhouse. Our story is Jack London's world-famous adventure classic, The Sea Wolf. And recreating his original role will be Edward G. Robinson, with screen director Michael Curtiz. Now, here again is tonight's star, Joan Fontaine. Joan, you've given us such a fine performance in our story tonight about love and psychoanalysis. You must be an authority on the subject now. Oh, I am, Jimmy. Now all I need to start practicing as an analyst is a patient. Here I am, Dr. Fontaine. <laughs> You're just the person to help me analyze the most passionate love affair in musical history. The affair between the American people and RCA Victor's new Victrola 45. Just drop a chair and outline the symptoms, Mr. Wallington. Well, Dr. Fontaine, it's a clear case of love at first sound. RCA Victor introduced the new Victrola 45 record changer less than a year ago. And already its phenomenal sales prove it's clearly the people's choice for the system of the future. Why, the RCA Victrola 45 is sweeping the country. So what's your analysis, Doctor? Oh, it's a clear case of dream fulfillment. How do you mean, Dr. Fontaine? It's our dreams of recorded music come true. Yes, I know what you mean. Did you ever hear such superb tone on a record? Never. Or see an automatic record changer so fast and tiny and practical? Never. 
or one that costs so little with prices starting as low as $12.95 for a changer and records as low as 65 cents? Never. In fact, Jimmy, this love affair between the American people and the 45 records and changer isn't a case for analysis at all. It's a case for rejoicing. You were never right, her, Joan. For a musical love affair with a guaranteed happy ending, just visit your nearest RCA Victor dealers and meet the Victrola 45. The 45 is sweeping the country. Ladies and gentlemen, tonight instead of meeting the directors of It Had to Be You, Don Hartman and Rudolph Maté, here to make a special presentation is the Vice President of the Screen Directors Guild, the creator of such grand films as Shepherd in the Hills and the Damon Runyon Pictures, Butch Minds the Baby and Tight Shoes and many others, Albert S. Rogel. Thanks, Joan. You know, I've always hoped for the privilege of directing a picture with you as the star. Oh, wonderful. I'd like to work with you, Mr. Rogel. Good. And it's a deal. And you start right now as my assistant. <laughs> Here, hold this silver plaque. Oh, it's beautiful. Well, for the Screen Directors Guild, Joan, it's more than beautiful. You see, that plaque you hold is the Screen Directors Quarterly Award. And you're going to present it to the director whose work has been chosen by his colleagues as the outstanding directorial achievement of the past quarter. The name of the picture is Lost Boundaries. Mm -hmm. And the winner of the quarterly award, director Alfred Worker. Uh -huh. Thanks, Al, John. Thank you. It was a magnificent picture. Congratulations, Al. And... I'm especially proud because you were my former assistant. Thank you, Al. I want to express my deep appreciation to the screen directors for this award, and if I may, add my thanks to Louis de Rochemont, who produced the picture and gave me the opportunity of directing it. Lost Boundaries was not fiction, and when a director gets hold of a true story with such vital content, it's pretty hard for him to go wrong. But thank you, Joan. Thank you, everyone. Good night. Good night, Al. Good night. Keep up thank the good work. And good night to you, Joan Fontaine, Alfred Worker, and Albert S. Rogel. Remember next Friday, Edward G. Robinson in The Sea Wolf with screen director Michael Curtis. Brought to you by RCA Victor, world leader in radio, first in recorded music, first in television. Had to Be You was presented through the courtesy of Columbia Pictures, currently releasing the award-winning production All the King's Men, starring Broderick Crawford. Joan Fontaine will soon be seen in the Hal Wallace production for Paramount, September Affair. Included in tonight's cast were Gerald Moore as George, Jay Novello, Lois Corbett, Frank Nelson, Wilms Herbert, Stanley Farrar, and Frank Barton. It Had to Be You was adapted for radio by Richard Allen Simmons, and original music was composed and conducted by William Lava. Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley, with dramatic direction by Bill Karn. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking and inviting you to listen again next Friday when RCA Victor presents... Screen Director's Playhouse, star Edward G. Robinson, production The Sea Wolf, director Michael Curtiz. <laughs> Illness, suffering, helplessness. These evils never stop, and so there is never an end to the community chest campaign. The red feather chest of welfare funds is the heart of your community. Find it in your heart to give what you can to the community chest. Next, it's Jimmy Durante with Don Amici on NBC. NBC.